Hello and welcome to Money Markets and More with me, Dominic Frisby, coming to you today from the Finnish wilderness. That is a frozen marsh you see behind me. And I did not know this, but Finland is apparently in the Finnish language known as the land of swamps and lakes. How about that? And that is a frozen swamp you see behind me. It's all, I'm up here looking for the, for the, um, uh, northern lights in fact in this camera you can sort of vaguely see shades of green even now but I don't think those are the northern lights just yet but it looks pretty good huh and um, I'm not here looking for swamps apparently I mean it's all frozen over at the moment just coming to the end of the winter here but apparently in the summer all around here it is just a mosquito fest anyway today we're talking energy and of all the subjects I cover, I'll always get the most hits if I talk about the housing market. <laughs> Second place in the readership stakes, gold and Bitcoin. Uh, although they've come up against a new challenger lately in AI. If I talk about oil, nobody cares. Unless I frame that the subject around net zero or geopolitics. And then readership goes up. But then the reason for that is you're giving the subject a spicy political angle, which people in these uh, polarised times are attracted to. And there's one subject even less popular than oil, and that's natural gas. <laughs> I don't cover coal very often, though I imagine it would be down there in the dirt, forgive the pun, along with those other fossil fuels. Now, while the politics around energy may draw clicks, I guess people are just not that interested in energy itself. But the world which we enjoy today would not be possible without the extraordinary energy that derives from fossil fuels. It just makes so much possible. And almost on point of principle, we should be investing in fossil fuels because without fossil fuels, we are doomed. Our lifestyle is doomed. And this fact, or is it an opinion, seems to be lost on many who determine policy in the Western world. They are committed in their drive to wean us off this energy source that has brought more people out of poverty and done more to raise living standards than probably any policy or any substance in all human history. So it's with a certain amount of foreboding that we turn to the oil markets today, but turn to them we must because oil makes the world as we know it go round. Now global oil consumption is about 100 million barrels per day. Venezuela has the world's largest oil reserves. Saudi Arabia is the world's largest producer with an output of about 11 and a half million barrels per day. So Saudi Arabia accounts for more than 10 percent, well almost exactly 11 and a half percent of annual oh, daily global supply. Now Venezuela is of course no ally of the US but Saudi Arabia broadly speaking is. The US gives the Saudi government plenty of military and security assistance but perhaps I should have said was, was an ally because the Saudis have made two announcements this past week which will not please the Biden administration. Over the weekend, they, along with other major producers, that's last weekend, announced a surprise production cut of over one million barrels a day. And that follows on their announcement last October of two million barrels per day production cut. And I think it's fair to say the Biden administration was not happy about that. Now, why do such reductions infuriate? Because they push up the oil price and that makes for even more discontented citizens in these inflationary times, citizens who will be less likely to vote Democrat next year. The reductions also effectively increase the value of Russian oil exports and in these times of war and weaponized finance the last thing America will want to see is anything that increases Russian economic strength. Every dollar rise in the price of oil sees a $2.7 billion increase in Russian export value. That's one stat I read that's doing the rounds at the minute. 
Then there is the issue of America's strategic oil reserves. Now, in their attempt to put a, a lid on gasoline prices, the Biden administration sold 180 million barrels from the reserve last year, an average of $96 a barrel. And with falling oil prices, this was looking like a good trade, as long as they bought back, which is much easier said than done. And the plan was to buy back on the open market and then replenish the reserves, thereby, when they bought back, in the $67 to $72 range. And that target was reached, <laughs> but the administration, along with the entire investment world, we now know in retrospect, had two or three days in March to buy the sub $72 dip. And these were intraday moments. I doubt they managed it. I know I didn't. So the US Special Petroleum Reserve is now 372 million uh, barrels. That's the lowest level since 1984. The all-time high was 727 uh, million barrels, so more or less double what it is at the moment in 2010. But since that March 20th intraday low, Brent has gone from $70 to $85. So we now turn to irritation number two, which is the strengthening of Saudi energy ties to China. The traditional monogamous relationship with the US is now over, said Saudi analyst Ali Shihabi. And he said that this week in reaction to the announcement of a $3.6 billion deal that would see uh, the Saudis supply 480,000 barrels a day, half a million barrels a day, to China. And that follows a trade deal between China and Brazil. China is Brazil's largest trading partner to settle in yuan and reais rather than dollars. And it's all part of this gradual de-dollarization process that's happening. China's already settling with Russia and Pakistan in yuan. And it's not just de-dollarization, it's de-westernization. At 5.4% of its holdings, Brazil's yuan-dominated foreign exchange assets now exceed its euros. And at the Russian Davos, the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, which was held last week in New Delhi, one Russian official, State Duma Deputy Chairman Alexander Babakov, stated that a BRICS, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa alliance, was working on a new currency secured by gold and other commodities, including rare earth elements. And uh, he talked about establishing new monetary ties with a strategy that does not defend the US dollar or the euro, but rather forms a new currency competent of benefiting our shared objectives. So this, um, it's not a new concept, but it's, it's another step in the broader direction of travel. So coming back to the subject of oil. Recession, sagging demand has seen the price slide since 2002. But we seem to have found a flaw around $70. Now, it's forecast recession. In 1980, OECD nations made up 70% of global demand. 70%. Now, it's well below 50%. But all these demand forecast models, they focus on developed nations. In emerging markets, consumption is resilient. And as a result, global demand now exceeds 2019 pre-COVID levels, and it's only going to increase. As well as geopolitical factors, investment remains low. In 2014, investment was 900 billion a year, says the IEA. Now it's 400 billion. Um, and investment is what drives supply. Global stockpiles are at 2003 levels. So the investment house Goering and Rosenzweig says inventories at the year end could be their lowest readings since 1986. That's at the end of this year. Lowest since 86. But investors still refuse to allocate capital to the space they continue. Over the last two years, energy has outperformed any other sector in the S&P 500 by 130 percentage points, and the index by 150 percentage points. And yet, energy still represents less than 5% of the S&P's market capitalisation. 
that's, that's half, it's less than half its long term average and 65% below the 2008 peak. Despite the outperformance, oil and gas are experiencing net outflows and its ESG plays a large role in this. Investment houses can't invest even if they want to because of ESG guidelines. Now these misguided anti-fossil fuel narratives in the woke West that fail to take into account the amazing things that fossil fuels have made possible do not help. Western energy policy is steadily impoverishing Westerners. Instead of investing and improving oil and gas production, we are replacing it with inferior, more environmentally harmful, more expensive sources. And no wonder so many nations are economically de-westernising. Despite weaker than expected second half demand, they say, we estimate that global oil markets were in structural deficit by as much as half a million barrels per day throughout 20 and 22, 2022. And it's going to be higher in 2023, they say. It won't change. None of this is going to change until there is a radical rethink of energy policy, which means a huge change in the discourse and thus of the personnel that determine policy. We are so far away from that. The lack of investment has been chronic for over a decade and it points to much higher prices further down the road. The West is getting left behind. Can you see why I think it's so important in a portfolio to have allocations to both gold and energy? I mean, it's just essential. Now, if you want to know how I invest in all of this, I put a link in my, to my Substack, and I outline the best ways to invest in oil and gas there. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm a, <laughs> it's hard walking in the snow. I, I sort of get out of breath. Uh, as you can probably hear, I'm panting ever so slightly. But thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Look out for my comedy show in early May at Crazy Cox. And I'll be back with another video on some market-related subject very soon. Until that, thank you very much for watching. From Finland, goodbye.